And if you will, if you'll put your name in the chat for record keeping purposes, and if you are not currently um, getting emails from us and would like to, you can add your email as well. You don't need to put it if you're already getting emails. So welcome. Um, it's a chilly day, but I've got um, loved ones up in Indiana where it's one degree. So we're not in that situation and we're glad about that. And so I'm excited to be here today with Taz and Kim. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, we're gonna do a little bit different format. Usually we're just kind of chatting, but they've prepared a slide for us, slide presentation. So I'm gonna um, turn it over to them, let them introduce themselves and then we'll get started. So Taz and Jim, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. We're excited about um, the things y'all are gonna be sharing with us today. So I'll let you introduce yourselves and go from there. All right, give me a second. I'm gonna try to share screen. Sure. I think you can start seeing my desktop. When I can see slides, I will let you know. While she's working on that, um, they've got some natural breaks in their presentation for questions. And so we'll pause for a second after four or five slides for questions. In, in the meantime, if you wanna go ahead and put your question in the chat so you don't forget, um, when they have that natural break and ask for questions, I'll read your question to them then. So if there's anything you'd like to ask, you're welcome to put it in the chat and then we'll have a few minutes at the end as well. Okay, I'm in slideshow form. You should be able to see it now. Can't see it yet, just still seeing boxes. You're sharing screen now. I can see it now. Thank you. Oh, that was new. Hey, we are in slideshow mode. All right. Let me just say hello, folks. My name is uh, Chaplain Fisher. Uh, by way of introduction, I've been a Navy chaplain for 30 years. Navy chaplains, we serve the Marines in combat. We serve ships in the Navy, that kind of thing. Also served with the Coast Guard. I was the senior, excuse me, I was a senior chaplain in Afghanistan for over a year and served with an army command unit at that time. And uh, I've been in direct combat in two wars after retirement. My wife and I developed a, a program for Samaritans First called Operation Heal Our Patriots. And uh, it offered resiliency classes for injured veterans uh, and injured veteran marriages seeking to restore some form of normalcy back to their relationships. And so it's an honor for me to be here today with you guys. Thank you. And I am Taz. I spent 20 years in the Air Force working in major acquisitions where I helped buy fighters and bombers on behalf of the Air Force. I also conducted major acquisitions on behalf of the Army, Navy, and the Marine Corps. So no weapon system I have worked on has ever been defeated by the adversary. Not many people can say that. During my career, I deployed twice to Afghanistan. Both times I deployed with the Army, not with the Air Force. So I did everything my soldiers did, did it, just did it much slower. We went, on, we went out on multiple missions every week. And I must confess, those deployments changed me. As a result, I spend my days in retirement trying to fill the gaps the average veteran needs and what the VA are mandated to provide. I spend much time on veteran outreach to share the knowledge and experience. Now we have three major goals for this seminar. First is to explore the different kinds of invisible injuries that often result from combat. The second goal, as you can see there, is to address the uh, sensitive issue of veteran suicide and some of the warning signs. And the third goal, is to acknowledge that families, families are impacted by combat and to offer hope to those families as well. Someone once termed the coin, someone once coined the phrase post-traumatic growth. And it's a good term because it removes the debilitation of PTS and places an emphasis on growth and real resiliency. And yes, some of the following discussions and graphics could possibly trigger someone regarding past trauma, but be assured that our goal here is to acknowledge the pain of trauma while offering hope and healing. 
So this presentation may include readings, media, and discussion around topics such as bad experience, loss of faith, sexual assault, pain, and suicide. We acknowledge that this content is difficult. We also encourage you to take care of your safety and well-being. Now, you guys all know what a mobile is. You maybe have one of these uh, over your baby's crib at one time or somewhere in your house. And the mobile, I think, illustrates a truth for veteran families. When one part of the mobile is touched and kind of jiggled, there's a jiggling effect that goes all the way through to every member of the family to some degree. And the same is true for veteran families. A combat experience doesn't just impact one member of the family, it impacts the entire family. Now the Im impact on the family is secondary post-traumatic stress, PTS. As of 2020, the VA has not yet conducted studies on secondary PTS. However, the VA does provide services to address secondary PTS in the form of couples and family counseling. You're gonna, go ahead. Here we illustrate how an untreated invisible injury may affect every facet of a family's life, summarizing the signs and symptoms you may witness in a veteran suffering from invisible injuries. You're gonna see this slide again, by the way, folks. It's kind of the, the standard thing, how it impacts the whole family. So less than 1% of the U.S. population, citizen and non-citizens serve in the U.S. military. These numbers in 2016, this included active reserves and National Guard. Of the fraction, um, of the fraction of the U.S. population, only 20% have deployed in hostile regions. Of the 20%, just 20% experience combat action, meaning the enemy is firing upon you and you're returning fire in defense of yourself, your team, and your position. Yet more than 40% of those deployed in hostile regions return with post-traumatic stress. As veterans, we need to remember the lessons we learned while on active duty. Now, in the next several minutes, we're gonna be defining and discussing the differences between post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and moral injury condition. Although there can be, there usually is some overlap between the three conditions, they are very different very unique from each other. Earlier, Taz had provided those uh, statistics regarding the numbers of actual combat participants. Now I'm just gonna give you some more, it's not gonna be on the slide, I'm just gonna give you some more numbers and facts that we'd like you to consider. And these numbers come from the Veterans Administration. Regarding post-traumatic stress, in 2018, there was nearly 65,000, 65,000, new VA disability claims for post-traumatic stress, and over 800,000 veterans are currently receiving compensation from the VA due to some level of post-traumatic stress symptoms. Regarding traumatic brain injury, the Defense and Veteran Brain Injury Center reported nearly 414,000 traumatic brain injuries among U.S. service members worldwide between 2000 in late 2019, so essentially for the 20-year the war. More than 185,000 veterans who use the VA for their health care have been diagnosed with at least one traumatic brain injury, and the majority of those TBIs were classified as mild. Regarding moral injury condition, the VA is studying this issue more seriously. Thus far, there really are no statistics per se. Now, we know just by what I said, what Taz talked about. The numbers are staggering for post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. However, moral injury is not really addressed by the VA. And you gotta ask the question why. I propose that it's because moral injury is a soul injury. It's based on one's spiritual and religious formation. And although the VA does employ chaplains, the condition is not acknowledged in diagnostic terms as PTS can be, which can be diagnosed psychologically. 
or traumatic brain injury, which is a actual physical injury and is able to be diagnosed. In my decades of working with veterans and family members and doing research for my doctorate, I have come to the conclusion that moral injury is a real source and a real symptom for many of our veterans' difficulties as they return from combat. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. MST is military sexual trauma, which is rape with rank. When we say rape, we assume the victim was a woman. The sad truth is men suffer from MST as well. The VA believes MST is underreported, but grossly underreported for male victims. MST can occur in a combat environment or while stateside. MST can occur anywhere. Untreated MST could further complicate treatment for invisible injury. And for today's discussion, we'll, we will focus on combat-related invisible injuries. This slide is a note to raise awareness so victims may get appropriate treatment. Now, we all know that PTS has been heavily researched in the last two decades. In the past, it's been called post-traumatic stress symptom, PTSS, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress condition, lots of names, symptom, condition, disorder, they all sound pretty permanent and, and kind of unchangeable. Now we're simply calling it post-traumatic stress. It's psychological in nature. And you can see from the slide there, just some of the, the uh, characteristics that uh, responses associated with it are indeed psychologically based. Now, many combat veterans don't like to sit with their back facing a door, for instance, you'll see some of these things. And it's, Unexpected loud noise can cause them to flinch or fall to the ground. That's happened to me a couple of times. But within the, but within the context of this condition, there's no physical injury. It's mostly psychological. But when we talk about TBI, that's something different. Traumatic brain injury is actually a physical injury. Now, unlike when you see a veteran that's <coughs> missing a leg or missing an arm, TBI is not visible just as pancreatic cancer may not be visible or heart disease may not be visible. But because roadside bombs are the weapon of choice of our enemies in the past 20 years, the shock waves of a massive explosion have had horrific debilitating effects on our veterans. We all know that if you violently shake a child, a baby, there can be harmful lasting effects on that child. And the same principle applies to adult veterans as well. As, and we have the CAT scans, and we actually have the x-rays that provide the evidence that there is damage to the brain and these physical damage to the brain in these veterans. In this context, the damages and responses tend to be physical in nature, as you can see on the slide there. The worrisome news at this time is that the damage may be considered as irreparable if if it's left untreated. However, with the therapy, with therapy, the traumatic brain injury patient may be able to recover most of their cognitive abilities just as a, a stroke patient is able to do. Now I'd like us to explore what may be for many of us, uh, kind of a, a, new and, uh, a new condition, a new symptom. Uh, it's a condition that I'm more of an expert on actually, moral injury condition. As the term implies, this is not a physical or a psychological injury necessarily. It's what's been called a soul injury. In short, it's been caused by a, a veteran feeling guilty for engaging in an act of combat that usually involved the killing or the taking of a life. Now there are three, comp there are three components to moral injury condition. And it's been identified by Dr. Jonathan Shea. He was the first one to really identify these conditions. And uh, he says there's three elements to it. Moral injury is present when, first of all, there has been a sense of betrayal of what is morally right. The second is that that, that betrayal has been by someone who holds legitimate authority, whether it's like a commanding officer or the person in charge. And third, it's usually a high stakes situation. Of course, when you're in combat and there's death and killing, 
that is a high stakes situation. From a theological perspective, I would also include a surfing of what theologically it's called Amago Dei, which is uh, the image of God, assuming the role of God, assuming the image of God. A soldier with a rifle in his or her hands holds the power of life or death. But theologically speaking, as a chaplain, uh, only God gives life, and so only God has the authority to take a life. But there's something, I think, in what I call our spiritual DNA, which is combined with the tenets of Western civilization based on Judeo-Christian behavior foundations, that values human life. And it has an impact, of some degree at least, when a life is taken. Now, this condition cannot be resolved with a pill. It cannot be resolved with a pat on the shoulder or a pat on the back with the statement, son, you are only doing your duty. That doesn't resolve the guilt. Here we go. Now here are some of the, uh, here's, some, here's a slide that illustrates some of the facets of moral injury. And you can see it really goes through the whole gamut of the human condition, but it basically, really just kind of boils down to that of unresolved guilt and a sense of failure that uh, has an impact on the veteran's life and thus on the life of the family. And it comes in a variety, as you can see with the slide there, with a variety of negative thoughts, negative behaviors to include suicide, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Now let's just talk a little bit about how some of these conditions overlap. Although PTS and traumatic brain injury are separate conditions, you can see there in the middle that there's an overlap between the two. For instance, the explosion of a Humvee or the explosion of an MRAP, which are those massive troop carrying trucks. There's certainly a traumatic event, psychological event, that's the PTS. Yeah. But there's also some physical damage that can happen too to the brain through the, the blast waves, which is the TBI. So you can see right there in the, midst, in the middle, cognition is impacted, as well as psychological response and, and really physical injuries that perhaps can't be seen. And although post-traumatic stress and moral injury are two separate conditions, you can see even in this slide, there can be overlapping behavioral results. As a chaplain who's completed doctoral work in moral injury and yes, as a professional in, in theological ministry, I believe that moral injury is best rectified when one is in partnership with a religious professional who is a representative of God's authority. I believe that a confessional story can release the veteran from silent suffering. And I believe, uh, this can lead to an attitude of repentance, which restores one with a higher moral authority, or as they say, their higher angels, and concludes, often concludes, with a service of penitence, usually expressed in some form of uh, community service. Now that we've had a basic introduction to PTS, traumatic brain injury, and we see the numbers presented by Taz and myself and the VA, I feel that it's a fair question to ask if PTS may have additional factors that impact the psychological diagnosis. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I have counseled hundreds of individuals who in addition to PTS, also admit to other conditions, which include bipolar, depression, personality disorder, ADD, fetal alcohol syndrome and, and other conditions. And so just you guys as counselors, if you deal with this kind of thing, you've got to understand they add to the complexity of invisible injuries and family dynamics. Denise, do we have any questions coming up in the chat right now? We do not yet have any questions. Thanks for pausing. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's just continue. At this juncture, we're going to take a little bit of a turn, and Taz is going to address the issue of physical pain 
and uh, how that impacts the life of a veteran and how that can impact the life of a veteran's family. So Taz. This illustrates how post-traumatic stress in combination with pain can make everything worse. So while on active duty, I was essentially the mean daughter. The stress, the cumulative stress was intense. I come home to the mountains to decompress. I never socialized in the county. Instead, I spent time with my family and literally moved rocks and dug ditches. No matter what I did or tried to do, I was still mean daughter. After I retired, I was able to decompress and mean daughter eventually went away. That took about a year. And a couple of years into retirement, my back pain was so intense. My parents saw glimmers and mean daughter coming back. The only difference is I was able to apologize for my irritability. Pain magnifies all the negative emotions. To recover from invisible injuries, the veteran should address the issue of pain. One of the more debilitating symptoms is sleep deprivation. Sleep is crucial in resetting the mind and body and physical pain can disrupt that sleep cycle, creating a potential for a downward spiral. Physical pain can trigger sleep disorders, sleep disorders such as insomnia and night terrors. We think of pain as merely a physical sensation, but Pain affects every facet of our lives, psychologically and emotionally. Mild or severe pain will make us avoid activities, but the avoidance actually increases pain, fear, anxiety, anger, frustration, and depression. Pain can be so stifling, it can decrease our ability to cope with life's most simple obstacles. And pain can increase the intensity of post-traumatic stress Traumatic, traumatic brain injury and moral injury condition. When in pain, how excited would you be to go play with the kids? Probably not so excited. And how else can pain affect the family dynamics in general? Whether you suffer from invisible injury or not, everyone has experienced pain to a varying degree. For some, chronic pain is all too familiar. When in pain, we very likely recognize these thoughts and behaviors. Chronic pain can make you self-isolate and disengage in family activities. If suffering from pain and invisible injuries, these thoughts and behaviors can peg off the scale and lead to self-destructive behavior. Just like smells and sounds can trigger an invisible injury episode, Pain can trigger post-traumatic stress episode. PTS episodes can exacerbate the pain. Chronic pain can lead to depression and depression is a common invisible injury symptom. Pain and invisible injuries are inextricably linked. The pain cycle is really a downward spiral possibly leading to suicide. How can we stop the cycle? or the downward spiral with pain management. And pain management takes commitment and hard work. So here's how we can help. Listening to the second rant session provides a cathartic release. Constant ranting or complaining, however, only perpetuates the negative feelings. Just like in any patient care situation, asking or suggesting is far more effective than telling someone what to do. This gives the patient a sense of control and independence. Talk to your VA primary care doctor, ask for pain management referrals, something other than medications. The pain management alternatives to medication gives the body a chance to heal. All these activities are self-care. Take care of yourself. I take it there's no other questions, Denise? Not yet, no, thank you. Thank you. Again, when pain and invisible injuries go untreated, then all the facets of life seems to go out of control, then the ultimate tragedy. The VA conducts a nationwide study on veteran suicide 
every year. The 2021 annual report showed 17.2 veteran suicides per day in 2019. That's one in every 84 minutes. So by the time you finish watching a movie, one veteran has committed suicide and another is prepping for suicide. Now these numbers do not include what I call the slow suicide, alcohol and drug abuse. My question is, combat veterans have literally survived hellfire. When we come back into normal society, we can't seem to relate, much less reintegrate into normal life. So what do we do? Well, the first step is awareness. Shocking, the numbers are shocking, but at least you're now aware. If you leave chronic pain unchecked, if you leave un invisible injuries unattended, the unfortunate consequence is suicide. As family, we tend to make excuses for our loved ones. Analyze our loved one's behavior. Yeah. So please pay attention to the warning signs. Well, and I wanna emphasize, you can see the warning signs up here, <clears throat> that usually there are warning signs that precede a suicide or a suicidal, a, a suicidal attempt. One sign, is not necessarily a sure sign of suicide. Just as if you have the sniffles, that doesn't mean that you've got COVID. It takes a lot of other things, a lot of other symptoms, and you say, oh, it's COVID. But if three or four of these signs occur, occur then that should uh, raise some warning signs that there's a real danger. And sometimes you can ask one simple question that can diffuse the act of su suicide. And that's the simple question. Are you thinking of committing suicide? And anyone can take action. So what can we do in suicide prevention? Now that you recognize the basic signs of suicide, here's what we can do. The crisis line will help our veteran, whether they are enrolled in the VA healthcare system or not. Anyone can call. Family and friends may call on behalf of the veteran or simply ask, how are you? Are you considering suicide? But before we get to the point of crisis, we can create a positive environment for the veteran. And maybe the family and the friends may have to change some of their behaviors or some of the ways that they think or, or, or what they need to do for their veteran to heal. For instance, if you're, if you're not complaining so much or angry over the little things in life, maybe you can find meaning in life. Maybe meaning in life means finding faith. Uh, if you're a glass, half empty kind of person, uh, try thinking glass half full. You can choose to find gratitude in just about any situation. Do you have a purpose outside of yourself? Do you have a purpose outside of your family? It's important to take care of yourself so that you can care for others. And yes, it's easier to say that than to do that, but the attempt will not go unnoticed by your veteran. And if you find it, then your veteran will have a real example to consider and possibly follow your path of positivity. So let's say our veteran is starting to see meaning, beauty, and purpose. It'll take a fellow veteran to remind your veteran how it was. There isn't any life challenge that was more difficult than the fields of battle. While, in, while on active duty, we always replan. We always never let a setback bring us down. We always made it happen. For some reason, many young veterans seem to have forgotten these lessons and experiences. As a fellow veteran who's been there, I can remind them. And I take it we have no questions, Denise? No questions. Okay. Well, here we're going back to the mobile slide and you can see we've explored, we, we really have kind of explored the ugly side of invisible injuries. We know the differences now, we understand the impact that post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury and moral injury condition can have on a family. But now let's consider some ways that we can build resiliency or as I've heard other veterans describe it, post-traumatic growth. And the point is, no one has to stay in the pit. 
just like this mobile picture, we talked earlier about how a, a, negative, a negative event can jiggle through the whole family. The point is that with this mobile in this picture, positive growth involves many people in the family and the community at large. And just as one action can cause a positive, a negative influence throughout, positive, in, positive actions can also cause a, a very positive action throughout the whole family and community. And so we want to talk about some of the positive things. Let's go to the next slide, Taz. Now this is a busy slide, but it implies some ne necessary truths into every family that seeks healing and reconciliation. When it comes to family dynamics, there's no perfect family and there's no perfect family model. However, if you look at this, some family practices and some family models are better than others. The hardest aspect of the slide Maybe to admit that your current family model or your, your family of origin is placed in one of the extreme corners of the square there. Maybe you're rigid or disengaged or chaotic in a mesh. Behaviors and attitudes may need to change in family behaviors if you, try, if you want to try to get to the, the middle yellow zone there. But Family dynamics, you have to admit, and you have to recognize that family dynamics is hard work. Changing individual behaviors, changing family behaviors is a challenging thing. But change does not happen unless there's intentionality and purpose. And so we encourage good families. The other thing that has to, that we want to look at, we have to consider when it comes to veterans and family dynamics is uh, what kind of person are you and what kind of person is your veteran? In other words, what's the temperament type? And how does the temperament of family members apply to the interaction and the relationships of family, friends, and others? There's actually 16 temperament types that fall into four quadrants and, and are very simply illustrated in this slide here. Basically, it's important to ask if a veteran or a family member is a extrovert or an introvert? Where do you fit on that scale? Are they rational? Are they emotional? Are they thinkers? Are they feelers? Are they quick to make decisions or are they somewhat hesitant to make a decision? The combination of these characteristics make the individual and are oftentimes usually hardwired into the personality of the veteran. You look at the slide here, are they sanguine? That means do they tend to be happy-go-lucky and a friend to everybody? Are they uh, choleric? Are they more pessimistic? Are they more driven? The phlegmatic uh, temperament tends to be more calm, clear, thinking, solid. Melancholies are like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh, always a bit of sadness and depression. And to let you know, the last two slides, the one on families and this one on temperament, uh, they can be a week-long seminar in and of themselves. I've just simplified the points of these two slides to add to the awareness of how family dynamics and temperament types impact relationship, hope, healing, re and restoration when it comes to invisible injuries and veterans and the whole family dynamic. Any questions at this point? Not so far. Okay. So let's ask the question, what kind of resources are available to veterans and their families? So all you have to do is to contact me with your veteran's story. I can provide tailored recommend, recommendations for your veteran situation to help you get started. And when the veteran is ready, I will meet with them and give them moral support. My contact information is listed and it's free to share with any veteran in need. And for positive posts and helpful information on veteran resources, you can just follow me on Instagram or Facebook. And the next few slides are intended to give you a quick idea of the available resources for your veteran. So here's a splattering of all the veteran resources available. There's much more out there, but I tend to research as a specific need arises. My veteran outreach has encompassed 
filling one-time financial gaps, um, elder care, VA health care, patient advocacy, VA home care, VA caregiver, and Medicare. I'm branching out into working with the younger veterans, and I collaborate with the experts in the various programs to assist the veteran with their specific need. Each and every veteran believes their situation is unique and that no one can possibly understand how they feel. In truth, the details differ, but when I articulate how a veteran could be feeling or anticipate their response, their look of shock is validated. And I tell them, hey, you're not the only one who feels that way or thinks that way. Are you ready to receive assistance, get some help? Would you like for me to help you get started? And sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. So I talk about the free trips, which bring together a lot of combat veterans and to witness the bonds, the respect, and the realization that they are not alone in, in their situation is, is quite overwhelming. And I do want just to affirm, there's probably nobody in this community that knows veteran administration as good as Taz, but uh, that said, a little pat on the back and affirmation for Taz. We're starting to come to the uh, conclusion of the presentation. And mm -hmm. I've come to believe as a chaplain, military chaplain, you know, in combat, working with combat veterans, that there is no one magic formula for healing, restoration and transformation. However, in my experience as a military counselor, these are the three elements for giving this community service and tribe that are necessary for healing. And uh, a good resource book, let's go to the next slide. A good resource book is uh, this one right here. It addresses those three elements of tribe forgiveness and community. And that's uh, Chad Robichard's book, An Unfair Advantage, but it also addresses additional elements too, and it neatly organizes a path that the PTS or TBI or moral injury veteran can follow in order to uh, return to a more calibrated and normal life. You may be asking yourself, where can I get more information? These are some of the books and uh, programs that I myself have read and interacted with but I want to emphasize that there's a lot of other books and programs out there. Some are faith-based like Operation Heal Our Patriots, that's right here in, in Boone, uh, or organized in Boone and Deep Sea Valkyrie. Some are faith-based faith and some are not. There are literally thousands of veteran family programs out there. The reality is you're gonna to need to, you and your veteran are gonna to need to do your own research based on your own particular needs, based on your own struggles, based on your own interests. Consider your veteran, consider your family dynamics, start the Google searches, that's primarily a, a great tool to use, and just forge the future with hope and healing for you, your veterans, the people you work with, and the families. Well, that's all folks, as Porky Pig would say. Taz and I acknowledge that uh, we've covered a lot of topics in this presentation. We've introduced you to three invisible in combat injuries that have a significant impact on the quality of life of veterans and family members. Regarding military sexual trauma, we do wanna advocate for victims to come forward and address the pain in order to experience more complete healing. And regarding pain, Taz, uh, Taz described how physical pain can exasperate, exacerbate the, the conditions and invisible injuries and you know, even lead to suicide and, and the dangers of suicide. We've discussed how these issues can impact the whole family system. And finally, we've presented some, not all, we've presented some of the resources that are out there offered by both the uh, Veterans Administration and a whole host of other non-veteran type organizations. Taz and I hope that this presentation will serve as an introductory primer to understand your veteran and, po and possibly provide a background should you work with veterans. 
And now, uh, although there have been no questions throughout the, the, the formal presentation of the seminar, we hope you have questions now because Taz is an expert. We um, thank you very much for all that information. I am, for some reason, um, having some feedback. Um, so thank you so much for that. We did have a couple questions come in. Um, Taz, one question was, um, what's a good way to contact you if people don't use social media or email? Do you have a phone number that you're willing to share or what's another way to get in touch? I do have a phone number. Um, so it's, I can, I want to share it. Should I put it on here? Do you want me to... I was going to type it in the chat for you if you just okay. want to tell it to me. It's 704 575 Three, four, seven, two. Now, just keep in mind, um, I'm, re I'm retired and a volunteer. So my phone essentially does not ring between the hours of eight and eight, 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. So uh, what I encourage the veteran and their family to do is call me before you, uh, call me long before you have to call 911. Because if you can't get a hold of me, then your real phone call is really the 911, right? So, and also just to let you know, so you're not frustrated, my phone automatically dumps the phone uh, voicemail for phone numbers it does not recognize. So there's things I've done to set up the phone. Essentially, I, I'm carrying a brick with a lot less features and functions than the average smartphone. But I found that my uh, sanity has been well-preserved. Okay. Uh, thanks, Taz. Another question um, they wonder, and I think you may have kind of briefly touched on this, whether you do this as a volunteer or as a staff of an agency. So I know the answer to that, but I was gonna let you answer the way you want to. Um, just a volunteer. So I belong to a number of um, nonprofits. I'm a lifetime member of the Veteran Foreign Wars. I'm a lifetime member and a volunteer driver for the Disabled American Veterans. And I'm also a volunteer with Amora Hospice and Palliative Care, and I only serve the veterans. Thank you. Um, and to the audience that's listening, if you have any comments that you would like to make to Taz or Jim, if you'll put them in the chat. Um, I do this every week. I copy and paste the chat into an email to the presenter so they have time to read them later when they um, are not sitting in front of a screen. So we've had a couple of thank yous come in for sharing the information and for your service. So I'll be sure and send those to y'all so you can um, read them later. And... Any other questions? I get one question that I have. We talked a lot about veterans and we talked a lot about families. If someone in the family needs um, support or yeah, support and the veteran is not interested in getting help, places that the family can utilize support without having to, the, the veteran having to be involved? So um, there's a nonprofit called the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. And they have fellows across all 50 states. And they're essentially unpaid volunteers. And the foundation provides resources to these fellows to provide caregiver support. So think, think in terms of elder care. Um, let's just say my parents need um, care. I need to take care of my parents, my elders. So I am technically a caregiver. So there are plenty of support groups for caregivers in that situation. Um, but surprisingly, there's very few, very tailored and targeted support groups for the veteran caregiver. So, um, I've seen the caregivers, um, workshops or sessions where the caregivers come in and they do complete rant sessions, get things off their chest, which is very cathartic, or they ask about particular resources and how to get things started. 
Uh, they go over tips and tricks, for example, on how to talk to your veteran. Um, like the biggest number one complaint I hear is my veteran never talks about it, never tells me their story. How do I get him to talk about it? Well, the sad truth is as veterans, and Jim will testify to this, we won't tell our stories to non-veterans because that's our war is not so pretty. And you don't want to know all that. And the movies won't tell you what it's really like. So um, I, I just tell the family members to encourage the veteran to talk to somebody within the VA. If they're against the establishment, then talk to another veteran. And they can call me anytime. And, um, and but we also go over just in case, what if the veteran does tell, tell me the story? What do I do? And I, I met this, Jim knows her. I know this Blue Star mom, she's a crier. Give her good news, she cries. Give her bad news, she cries. I'm like, mom, you need to sit as far away as possible for me because I can't deal with that. She goes, that's okay, as she's crying. So my, my thing is, hey, if you're a crier, it's okay to cry. But number one, Try to listen to the story without any interruption. Don't ask questions. And I, I'm going to just tell you right now, having been in the fields of combat, some of these stories don't make any kind of sense because you're just throwing random words at you. It's like a word vomit, if you will. And then, and then they get the story out. My thing is I, I try not to flinch, maintain eye contact as much as possible which is not a cultural norm for me. And, and I don't interrupt them. And then when they're done with their story, I tell the veteran, I said, hey, thank you for sharing. I really, really uh, appreciate it. And I'm sorry you had to go through that, but um, you know what? I'm glad you're here, here now. I'm glad that you're a part of my life. I think the county is very, uh, proud to have you as part of the community. Let me and, let me jump. Uh, let, let me jump in here too, and just uh, really affirm what uh, what Taz is saying. Also about uh, the little the Elizabeth Dole Foundation is really good. Really, whoever asked that question, what you're talking about is secondary post traumatic stress, and uh, you know that's one of those things where you, if you Googled it, you'd probably find that there really are resources out there. And just one, I'd like to recommend one movie that deals, it, it's a movie, it, you know, it deals with post-traumatic stress, but secondary post-traumatic stress, as well as the invisible injuries we've talked about. And it's called The War, The War. And it stars uh, Kevin Costner and Elijah Woods. Um, and it really deals with the whole family dynamic and the the secondary post-traumatic stress and how it does, it does impact the family. So just, just a thought there. Hey, Denise, I, I just saw a comment. I just wanna address it. Okay. Um, and I appreciate the feedback to whoever made it. They said they liked the presentation style of male, female. And that was not by design. It was just by pure happenstance. And I'll just tell you, um, Jim is one of the few chaplains that I've run into since I've uh, ran, uh, retired that still continues chaplain services or chaplain type assistance. And um, I, when he and I first met, I asked him if he would assist veterans. So he's my, one of my resources. And when I looked across the community, all in the high country, there was never anyone to explain how to get started. Like if you're not enrolled in the VA healthcare, how do you go get it? How do you get into it? There was never one, anyone to say, oh, you need a ride to your a medical appointment and you're a veteran, we'll take you there with, through the DAV. There was no one to say that. So I, I saw it as a gap. And um, in my 20 years in the military, you don't complain, you just do it. So I decided on my own just to fill that gap. So when, um, and Jim and I know people in the Blue Star Mothers of the High Country, 
and they talked to both of us about, or uh, they approached Jim to put together a, uh, a workshop regarding invisible injuries as it pertains to the veteran's family. And I called Jim up, I said, hey, did you know? And I started prattling off 50 resources. He goes, well, I guess you're my guest speaker then. <laughs> so even though we knew of each other, knew each other, were friends, that's how this whole presentation came about. Um, and then over the last few months, we took this workshop format, boiled it down into this 30 minute primer. Well, we definitely appreciate all of this information. We're gonna start thinking about wrapping up. I wanna give you each an opportunity to say one last, um, something we didn't think to ask you or you didn't think to cover. If someone's listening and they're um, either struggling with these issues themselves or have a loved one, what's the last? And then to the audience, you can be typing comments in as we're starting to move towards wrapping up. What's one last thing that you'd like to share with us as before you have to go? Um, it sounds like from talking to Denise that um, there's a lot of folks who are participating that are in the helping to heal biz business. Um, I, I do want to point out that it is my belief that post-traumatic stress for the average person or for the person, non-military, non-veteran, is not the same as post-traumatic stress for a veteran. Um, the in 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 warfare there's like there's no respite there's no break you can literally smell in the air hopelessness and despair and um a lot of the trauma that the veterans that i've i've spoken with that a lot of the trauma they experience is because of their deliberate decision to take action or not take action. Um, and I think law enforcement and first responders probably come closest to that, but I, th I think it's different. And it all ties back to, as Jim was saying, um, about moral injury. Okay, thanks for that, Taz. Jim, what's your, what one last thought would you like to share with us before we have to go? You know, it's easy to despair. But I really do think that there is hope, there's healing, uh, there's reconciliation, and, and those three kind of the, the, the three elements, tribe, faith, forgiveness, uh, community, <clears throat> is all important. And I would just say for, for you folks out there, always be positive, always be inspirational, always show that there's hope, show that there's, you know, with, you can get out of the pit. And then I would say, don't be afraid to bring faith into the picture because faith, I think, actually has an impact on post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury, as well as moral injury. So don't be afraid to bring in the faith element. I, th I think people, find, people can find hope and inspiration in that if it's approached the right way by us as counselors. Thanks, Jim. So we had put someone put in the chat the um, a link to the Is Elizabeth Dole Foundation. We also put in the chat Taz's phone number. Um, if you, in case you're wondering what kind of person you're going to be calling when you call Taz, Jim, I don't have a story about you yet. Maybe one day. Um, when Taz first came to meet with me, um, people rarely give me things. It, I just don't work with a kind of population that that has the resources to share. So Taz came walking up <laughs> with a case of, to of um, tissues that was almost as big as her and was like, this is for you because we're meeting for the first time. I was so excited that somebody had brought me something that was so useful and there was so much of it. So just know if you do reach out to her that she um, is very compassionate and giving and seems to be able to sense what's needed and, and how to be helpful. So thank you again, Taz, for my gift. <laughs> You're welcome. So hey, uh, for all the healers, the the healers out there, um, cumulative stress and secondary pressure mark stress is real. I hope you two find a way to turn it off and take care of yourself, um, because you can't help others. You can't help yourself first. That, that's my belief. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to copy the chat and put them in an email to Jim and Taz so they can read your comments when they have time. Thanks, everybody, for being with us today. I hope the rest of your day and the rest of your week goes well. Remember to rest when you can and make sure that your own needs are taken care of. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.